Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening, everyone. My name is Les, and I'm an alcoholic. And it is an absolute delight and joy to be here. As far as all of you are concerned, I talk funny. I talk Canadian. And uh, I'm grateful to the committee for allowing me to be here, along with uh, my wife by marriage. I am somewhat like Paul Anka. I don't like to sleep alone. And, uh, but really, to all of the committee for this very kind invitation to add an international flavor to your conference, I am indeed very grateful. And I would like you to meet that lovely lady who uh, has shared my recovery. Uh, sitting down there in the center is uh, my bride of 23 years as of uh, three weeks ago, Betty. I, uh, I was particularly pleased to hear Sally say last night that uh, her parents had uh, been transferred to St. John's, Newfoundland. It made me feel at home because I was born in Newfoundland. And it's rather peculiar that uh, a Canadian from eastern Canada uh, some time ago would come to the southeast and would find the, the marvelous warmth and hospitality that you provide. And not only that, the, the love and understanding. As uh, someone said today to us that we were a long way from home. And I, I, without intending to be critical, said, no, we're a long way from where we live. Because this really is very much like home to us. And a lot of my sobriety and uh, our recovery is indeed tied up in the southeastern United States, in Atlanta and Chattanooga and Florida, so it, it's really a homecoming. Let me tell you a little about what it was like, and I hope you all had a good day uh, today, because uh, in our meetings in, up in Nova Scotia, we, we want to find out what kind of a day you had. And usually, if somebody walks into the meeting, we ask, how was your day? So I hope you had a good day. Let me tell you a little about me and a little about what's happened to me and about the great joy of Recovery in Alcoholics Anonymous. Before I do that, let me tell you a very funny story about a Canadian that uh, some of you might relate to. Uh, this chap was over in England during the war, and he got on one of those confounded English trains with the separate compartments, you know. And when he stepped into this compartment, on one side were two very distinguished English gentlemen with their bowler hats in London Times. And on the other side was the epitome of the English lady, the brimmed, wide-brimmed hat and the silk gloves. And in the seat next to her was her French poodle. So the Canadian, being somewhat diplomatic, said, Ma'am, would you move your dog, please? I want to sit down. And the English lady said, I absolutely refuse. And the poor Canadian went the whole length of the train, couldn't find another seat, came back to the same compartment and said, Ma'am, I'm going to ask you again. Would you move your dog, please? I want to sit down. Same response, I absolutely refused. He didn't bat an eyeball, went to the window, flipped it up, reached over, picked up the poodle, and chucked it out. And one of the English gentlemen folded his London Times, raised his bowler hat, and said, I say, you Canadians are all a bit rare. And by this time, the guy was just a little incensed. He said, what the hell do you mean we're a bit rare? And he said, you eat with the wrong fork. You drive on the wrong side of the road, and now, by Jove, I believe you've thrown the wrong bitch out the window. <laughs> There's a whole lot of that in me, I'll tell you that. Uh, I, I listen to the two ladies who have spoken before me, and, uh, and I'm, I'm intrigued when I listen to talks in Alcoholics Anonymous. 
All of us have very similar patterns, and all of us have things about us that we relate to. I grew up in a fishing village with two of the finest people in the world as parents, and for as long as I can remember, I felt different. I just felt different. Without foundation, without any basis at all, I felt unloved and unwanted. I was an overachiever. Tell me it couldn't be done and I'd go do it for you. And just to give you one little example of how really crazy I was as a kid, I remember when we got our first 16 millimeter sound motion projector in, a projector in our school. And by this time, I was in high school, and the principal came in, and he said, I want you, you, and you, Studley, to learn to operate this thing for the other kids. He picked a guy who is now a doctor, and another guy who's a university professor, and me. Those two kids took a half an hour, found out how to thread the projector, and went home. I got home at 8 o'clock that night. Not that I was that slow. By the time I got home, I knew everything there was to know about that projector. I knew how it functioned. I knew that the lamps had to be replaced. I knew everything. Basis for alcoholism, I don't know. But that was to be the pattern of my life for 28 years. And just to show you how crazy I am, I finished high school. My brother was in the Royal Canadian Air Force in Manitoba. And I went there to go to university. And it was in Manitoba I had my first drink. I never want to forget it. It was a Saturday night, the first Saturday in July, 1957. My brother gave me a drink with an admonition. He said, here's a bottle of beer. You can take it and use it, or you can take it and abuse it. I remember the bottle. It was Carling's Red Cap Ale. Why? Why is that so important to me? I guess that tells you again that I'm very much a typical alcoholic. Drinking was important to me. Not not the bottle of Carling's Red Cap Ale, but the effect that it had. See, I was a I was a walking bundle of fear. And I felt incompetent and I had two left feet. And if I got within Five feet of a girl, strange things happened to me. I got tongue-tied, and I, you know, I had to stop my knees from knocking, and I didn't know how to react socially. And when I got that magic elixir down in me, that Carling's Red Cabby, all of that stuff just evaporated. I was no longer afraid. I learned how to dance the first night I drank. Not only that. I asked a girl to dance the first night I drank. And not only that, I got drunk the first night I drank, because I drank it for the effect. I cannot ever recall in the 12 years that I drank, ever once, taking a drink to be sociable. I wanted that stuff for a reason. The reason was obvious. I wanted it to quell my fear, to make me comfortable. I also had another problem. I didn't fit in. I didn't belong anywhere. And I remember the second year that I was in university walking down the corridor with a mammoth hangover one morning, and two of my professors were walking by. And one said to the other, because I was not doing well in university, what does that fellow Studley do? And the professor said, he drinks. And my chest swelled up, and I felt good. Now I was somebody, and I belonged somewhere with the drinkers. And that was important. I've tried to describe this, this thing called act of alcoholism, and I suppose the best terminology that I can use for my alcoholism was that it was very much a feeling illness. In addition to not fitting in and not belonging, I was super sensitive. All you had to do was just say one word the wrong way, and I jumped at you. I had tissue paper skin. Very, very sensitive. 
Well, anyway, I learned everything there was to, uh, to learn at the University of Manitoba in two years. And that's a lie. Truth was, I got kicked out. <laughs> and I went back to Newfoundland, taught school. And I almost got fired before I got hired there because I wrote a letter that was not complimentary to the premier, which would be tantamount to your governor. Uh, I was suffering another bad hangover, and he came and gave a speech, a political speech that I objected to when I wrote a lo uh, letter to the local paper and uh, just about got fired. I taught for four years. In the third year, I... Uh, went to a soccer game in my hometown, and I met Betty there, and I asked her for a date, and she said no, and that's when I decided to marry her. It took me three weeks to get a date with her, and nine months later she said, I do, and oh, God, did she. It was marvelous. She had no idea what she was getting herself in for. I finished my teaching career, and I'd had a taste of radio broadcasting when I was in university. And uh, there was a new radio station being built in a little town called Grand Falls, and I applied for the job and got it, and my alcoholism started to blossom. I was a star. And uh, it never occurred to me for the first six months that I was in radio that there was a button on that thing that set off. I just thought everybody had to listen. And... Uh, of course, having that kind of public exposure allowed me to frequent a lot of places. But the pay wasn't that good back in the early 60s, and I was uh, drinking a lot more. And so I applied for a job with the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, or as the French Canadian once called it, the Canadian Broadcorps and Castoration. <clears throat> and... Uh, I got a job in Gander, Newfoundland, the crossroads of the world that used to be. And there, if you uh, thought my drinking was bad, I had news for you. It got progressively worse. And to give you an indication of how well I drank in Gander, they had an all-night bar at the airport called the Big Dipper. And uh, we were there four and a half years. The four and a half years we were there, the place was open 24 hours a day. We left after four and a half years, and they went to an 18-hour-a-day shift. And it was in Gander that I developed some very interesting idiosyncrasies and some very interesting love affairs. And I don't know if this has ever happened to any of you, but it happened to me. I, uh, I fell in love with porcelain. I, I don't know if, if any of you have ever had that experience. And I will argue with anyone that alcoholics are not intelligent people. Have you ever made those split-second decisions early in the morning? Do I sit or kneel? <laughs> and I have prayed many prayers embracing cold porcelain, oval in, in form, in case um, I haven't been explicit enough. My prayers always began and ended with the same syllable. Oh! And it was there that strange things happened to our marriage. Uh, Betty left the bedroom. And in retrospect, I can understand that. I wouldn't have wanted to slept with me in those days if I could have avoided it. I became a pig. I weighed about 225, 230 pounds. I couldn't bend down to tie up my own shoes, and I drank constantly. I drank because it didn't belong in the CBC. I didn't quite know how to tell them that. They'd hired me, and they were paying me good money. And uh, I also developed another habit. I became a meditator. I don't know if that's happened to any of you either, but I, uh, I would go to the Big Dipper bar, depending on what shift I was working. I, I preferred the, the 4 to 12, because the bar was open all night and I could meditate. I would go and get drunk, and then I would find the nearest bathroom. And there I would meditate, sitting on the oval altar. Hour after hour after hour. There was only one thing wrong with that. I made one tactical error. I forgot to take my pants down. And they have not yet invented a deodorant capable of erasing that smell. 
I had the best collection of suit jackets in Newfoundland. I didn't have any trousers, but I had a lot of suit jackets. You got the picture. I, uh, <laughs> I worked at this radio station, and if I can find the architect who designed that place, I still have a resentment against him because in 1966 I was in deep trouble. People were not impressed with the way I was behaving. I was showing up for work somewhat inebriated. Now, you can get away with that in broadcasting and radio. And I did, except a couple of times. And the last time it happened, something peculiar went wrong. I had one of those long five-day weekends, off on Friday at 3.30, back on Wednesday at 3.30. Drank the whole weekend, went in on Wednesday afternoon after drinking all weekend and all day Wednesday. And see, if I hadn't had this bathroom problem, I'd have been all right. But I had the problem, and I had to go again. So I did the station break, and... Wandered into the bathroom. Now, I want to show you, I hope, what the bathroom looked like. As you went in the door, immediately on your left was a sink. Next to the sink was a toilet. Seventeen inches from that toilet was a 40-gallon hot water heater. Okay? And that was the bathroom. It was about four and a half feet wide. I got in there drunk, and... Uh, Forgot to take my pants down, and somehow managed to fall off the toilet and get jammed between it and a hot water heater. Now, I want to tell you how important I was as a radio star. I was gone for 45 minutes before anybody missed me. <laughs> and when they missed me, they couldn't find me. And when they found me, I couldn't talk. And now the trick became, how do we get him out of there? So they finally took the door off and got me out. And uh, the manager sent me home. And I went to a hotel and had some more. And he told me to be back the next morning at 8 o'clock. He would deal with the situation. Well, I went to the hotel and got a room, got another bottle of Amber Bacardi and consoled myself with the fact that I probably lost the best job I ever had. By now, we had two children, and uh, I was uh, suffering from a bad case of uh, self-pity. But something happened that night, something that hadn't happened in the previous 26 years of my life. I shook to about midnight, reached under the bed, and there was my friend, Mr. Picardi. Uh, we don't drink that fancy stuff like bourbon and that stuff in Canada, you know, rum is our medicine. And I took a swallow of that stuff, and some, for some reason I went and uh, stood in front of the mirror, and I saw something. I saw something that had escaped me for three years. I saw a 26-year-old man, 230 pounds, bloated, his eyes out on his cheeks, his hands shaking, holding a bottle of Bacardi, the reflection in the mirror. And I knew who the man was. I was wearing a $200 suit, the only one that I had pants for. And I started to talk to myself. Now, I'd done that many times, but it hadn't had very much impact until then. And I don't know why, but I realized that night that that stuff in that bottle had me beat. And I knew that tomorrow morning it probably cost me the job. I went home. I hadn't been home for four days. And I rang the doorbell. I, I, let me rephrase that. I went to the house where we lived in hate. All right? And I rang the doorbell, and I asked Betty to let me in. And she did. And she gave me some cheese and crackers and some tea. And we'd had many encounters in that house. I remember I, I'd get up and parade across the, fall across the corridor, crawl across the corridor, get to the bathroom. 
And it was at that period of my drinking that Betty got religion. Now, I don't know if it happened to any of your spouses, but mine got religion. She prayed a lot. Every morning when I shook too, she prayed. And every morning for six months, her prayer never altered one iota in word. I'd get to that bathroom shaking and sick and wanting to die and afraid I was going to die. And she would pray the same prayer every morning. From her bedroom, it would echo, die, you bastard, die. <laughs> and some mornings, as I say, I was afraid it was going to be answered, and other mornings I hoped it would be. Anyway, I had some visitors after the tea and the coffee after she'd gone to her room. Uh, they were not planned. They were the little pink elephants and the white rats that I'd seen before. And some guy with a garbage bag over his head who was breaking panes of glass on my back. And I think they call them hallucinations, DTs or whatever. I went to the radio station the next morning, didn't get fired, and decided to give up drinking for life. Had to save my job. My life lasted a long time, 21 months. Did it on my own. Two significant things happened. I wasn't fired, and there were two AA members in the town of Gander, Newfoundland. One of them ran the theater. Now, the Crescent Theater in Gander, Newfoundland, is not a first-run house. Okay? And he came over with a commercial one day, and he said, Les, I'd like you to read this on the air. I'd like you to get the theme music. The movie was about two years old then. So I got the theme music, and I read a commercial for a movie called The Days of Wine and Roses. And Court said to me, I'd like you to see that movie. And I said, well, Court, I'm very busy in the community, and I really don't have time. He said, what are you doing at 3 o'clock? And I said, nothing. He said, come over. I'll give you a private screening. I never want to forget that afternoon sitting in that theater alone watching that movie. And for the first time in my life, crying at my predicament and my inability not to drink. The other thing was that I went from being an active alcoholic to a workaholic. I got four part-time jobs. And uh, instead of drinking 24 hours a day, I worked. And in a sense, it was good therapy, because at least it kept me busy. But I didn't have an AA contact. I wouldn't have gone to AA at that point in time. I mean, I was a star. Now, come on. I mean, who would go, being a radio star, to a bunch of drunks? I mean, I knew what alcoholics were. I'd seen them on the street corner of most major Canadian cities. They wore long coats, odd shoes, no socks, and they had their hand out. And I was a star. I didn't fit. Couldn't be an alcoholic. I knew I was, but that was the facade. Well, in spite of myself, I was successful, and uh, after 20 months or so, or 18 months of uh, being sober or dry, the CBC transferred me to television in a city called Cornerbrook in Western Newfoundland. Now, to give you an idea of how well I'd recovered without AA, I walked into Cornerbrook, and my attitude was, look out, slobs, God is here. I'm going to show you how this is done. And like the typical alcoholic I am, I can't stand prosperity. And I was very successful. Within three months, I was reading the major newscast four nights a week. I was doing four half-hour shows, and everybody knew me. And if I was a star in Gander and radio, I was a big wheel in Cornerbrook and television. And you all know what dogs do to big wheels. So, uh... I I had an encounter in Cornerbrook with a man. He's about five foot two and a half. He is the happiest man that I had known up to that point in my life. He's also the most honest man I know, or had known up to that point in my life. His name is Cliff. And I was sitting in the control room one night pontificating on my greatness, my ability not to drink. And this little runt... Five foot two and a half, 
looked at me and said, Punk, you're going to get drunk again. Now, is that any way to talk to a television star? I want you to know that I resented him immediately. Hmm. I said, I am never going to drink again in my life. He said, Punk, when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, call me, because you're going to drink again. Well, I didn't disappoint Cliff. I didn't disappoint him at all. I went to a benefit hockey game one night. You know, the stars were playing, the television stars were playing the radio stars. Big stuff. Wanted them to all know who I was. I have gimpy knees. I stepped on the ice. My left knee went out of cup. I made one stride. My right knee went out of cup, and I had a lot of pain. Twenty-one months dry, I walked in the dressing room, hobbled in the dressing room between the first and second period of the hockey game, and some guy said, what you need is a beer. And I had four. Peculiar, isn't it? That I would forget all of the pain of the previous period of my drinking, and I would take that drink, knowing, and I knew, I knew what was going to happen, but I took it. And I proceeded to get drunk. We went to a reception after for the stars. And I got home at 3 o'clock in the morning, and Betty was up. And I walked in, and she tells me, this is what I said after 21 months. It's all your fault, you bitch. You know? And then I proceeded in the next three months to undo everything that had been done. I guess my best description of that period of my drinking was somewhat like a carousel. If you've ever been on a carousel at a circus, you know how it speeds up. My drinking had speeded up. I needed a lot more. My behavior became a lot more erratic. My temperament changed totally. I had to drink to survive, and I knew it. And was added now another element. I lived constantly for that three-month period every day, wanting to kill myself. But, of course, I was a television star. And television stars, if they're going to kill themselves, have to do it with finesse. You know? I treat it lightly because I've never been able to articulate the psychic pain that's associated with with that insanity. And I I finally found a way to do it. But a God that I didn't understand or didn't want any part of miraculously intervened in my life. It was June 28, 1968. The day that I pray God I never forget. I went to work that night, they tell me, after drinking all day. Now, I had one proud boast. That was that I never slurred on the air, and I never staggered. And during that three-month period, I had been drunk on the air every day. I don't know how many of you have ever been into a television station, but let me take you through my last drunk. The CBC did me a great favor. They televised it for me. I got to the to the television station in a blackout. I walked in and my usual star like fashion said, Where's the so and so news? And uh, walked into the studio. In those days we were using old black and white cameras and two hundred and fifty candle foot of light. Now that would be about Eight times the amount of light in this room right now. I hadn't eaten all day. I'd gone through about 60 ounces. And I sat on the three-leg stool to read the news. And on came the lights, and on came the camera, and on came the idiot. It went something like this. Good evening. Here's the CBC News. Now, there was even some humor in that, because for the first minute and a half, they thought there was something wrong with the microphone. 
<laughs> and there was. There was a drunken idiot sitting behind it. After a minute and a half, they found out what was happening, and they tried to get rid of me. You ever tried to shut up a drinking drunk who's on the air? We have little signs in the television business, you know, this means wind it up. And the poor floor director was in front of the camera going, you, you, you. And I was going blissfully along. And finally he got down to this sign, which means cut it, for God's sake, cut it, get out, get out. And I was going blissfully along. I had about 15 seconds of sanity during that thing. I think I remember this, but I'm never quite sure. It occurred to me, I think, that I was on the air and that I was totally drunk and that I was really making a mess of it all. But I had this funny little bubble in my stomach. And what I was really afraid of was that I was going to throw up in front of 70,000 people at supper time. <laughs> and wouldn't that be an affront to my dignity and stardom? <laughs> anyway, they, they finally, inside, they, they coordinated the rescue. They have a, a series of buttons they call a bank. And inside, in the audio booth, they have a switch. And they, the producer coordinated everything. He said, when he gets to the end of this story, we hit the button and the switch simultaneously. And, of course, they did. And I just disappeared off the face of the earth. I mean, everybody's television set in central and western Newfoundland went blank. And there's an old expression which says, there I was, gone. I really don't remember very much of that at all, if anything. I only remember what happened after. Somehow, in the deep recesses of my mind, I suppose, in my drunken, rum-sodden mind, something of what Cliff had said to me three months before must have gotten through. Or is it this? Or is it God's time for us. And I believe that all of us has a moment in our lives when we are absolutely incapable of making for us any rational decision. That will be to our own benefit. And I believe that God at that point in our lives makes the decision for us. And God made the decision for me that night because I looked at the cameraman. And again, I don't remember this. And when you hear the word miracle in AA, you're looking at one. I don't remember saying to that cameraman, for God's sake, call Cliff. And to be certain that I was doing what he thought I was doing, he said, what? And I said, for God's sake, call Cliff. I need help. Alcoholic blackout and all. And I will argue and have argued with members of our fellowship who tell me that you can't talk to them drunk. My dear friend, the man to whom I owe my life, my original sponsor, Cliff, was sitting watching that newscast. And when Clancy called, he didn't have to be told what kind of shape I was in. He already knew. And he didn't say, in my opinion, he's too drunk to talk to, or it won't do any good, or I can't be bothered tonight. He said, I'll be right there. And I think it behooves us to remember that we were all once so sick. And that there is no condition in God's terms on when we go see people. We never know. And we shouldn't know. But God knows. And Cliff came and he picked up the body. I lovingly refer to it as the body. It was neither vertical nor horizontal. 
It couldn't sit, it couldn't walk, and it couldn't talk, and was crying because it had lost its glasses. The enigma of the television star, you know. And he took me to a little AA club, he fed me some coffee, and he asked me some questions, and he took me home two and a half hours later as I started to come out of the fog told Betty what had happened, and I went to bed after I received three telephone calls, one from my former boss who had promoted me and was very in interested in my career, one from the man who had taken the bottle from me 21 months before after I'd fell off the toilet in the Gander radio station, and the other from my sister who is a registered nurse who was living with an alcoholic and who is one of my favorite people on this earth. And she told me in no uncertain terms that I was an alcoholic and that if I ever again disgraced her as I had that night, she would no longer want to see me and would no longer consider me her brother. And that was devastating because I loved Jane very dearly and she knew it. I had the visitors again. And somewhere around 6.30 on the morning of June 29, 1968, I made a decision. A decision that I almost got away with. There was a place outside the city, 13 miles out on the Trans-Canada Highway, that climbed up 300 feet of Newfoundland granite. And there was a guardrail that ran along that hill. And at the top of the hill, there was a break in the guardrail. And I had scouted that area because I knew what I had to do. And I got up and showered and shaved. <laughs> the only reason I could give for that is I suppose I wanted to be a good-looking corpse. Kissed Betty and the two boys and uh, had my hand on the doorknob, about to get into the car and drive 13 miles. And I, I kid you not, I that morning would have driven that car off that highway and I would have done it because I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. I was sick of being a failure. I was sick of living with fear. I was sick of myself. I was full of self-hate, yes, and self-pity, and I wanted out. And with my hand on the doorknob, the telephone rang. And Betty didn't answer it. It rang the second time, and I walked over and picked it up. And if you haven't guessed by now who was on the other end, let me tell you. It was Cliff. And he said, what are you doing? <laughs> now, I ask you, how do you, go out and, how do you go and tell someone? Well, I'm just going out to commit suicide, you know. And I lied again and said nothing. And he said, why don't you come down and we'll have a chat. And instead of going right, I went left down to his house. And for the first time in my life, somebody shared with me the language of the heart. The joy of sobriety. Cliff did not tell me what a failure I was as a husband or a father or a brother or an employee or a friend. He didn't have to because he knew that I knew. Cliff told me about him and about the marvelous miracle that had happened in his life. And he told me something that I pray God I never forget. He told me that it could happen to me. That this same freedom that he enjoyed was mine to have, if I so desired. It required of me that I go to a fellowship called Alcoholics Anonymous. And I had no excuses and no options left anymore. And that night I went to my first Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. Now I've heard many people say that they have gone to meetings and they do not recall the first meeting. God in his ultimate love and wisdom was looking after me that night because he granted me total clarity of mind. Don't ask me to explain it. I don't understand it. I only know what happened to me. I walked into that AA room with Cliff's foot in my back and at the door 
stood a man with a hearing aid and a cane. And he said the most important words that I had heard in a long time. He said something that did something for me. He said, glad to see you. And he shook my hand. Correction. He got a hold of my hand. He didn't have to worry about shaking it. I was doing well enough for both of us. I went in and I set out my hands on the right-hand side of that little club and overcame Einstein. Now, I don't know if any of you have Einsteins in your group, but they had one in the 12-step group in Cornerbrook, Newfoundland. His name is Bill B. I thought he was a doctor because he made an immediate, accurate diagnosis. He said, you're not feeling very well, are you? And then he said the magic words. He said, can I get you something to drink? And I thought, oh, God, they're going to give me the fix. Bill, I knew, was Einstein when he came out of the kitchen in that little club with a half-filled coffee cup. I knew he was Einstein. I knew that he knew me better than I knew me because he knew that I couldn't handle a full cup. Truth of the matter was I couldn't handle the half-filled cup either. I just shook too badly, and Bill very kindly took the cup put it down by my feet, went into the kitchen, came back, and performed for me one of the greatest acts of love that I have ever been the recipient of. He spoon-fed me my first half cup of AA coffee. And I pray God I never forget that. And a guy got up and he shared. His name is Clyde, and I saw him less than two weeks ago in Corner Brook. He went over for another reason that I'll get to in a minute. He so I talk, and I remember his talk tonight as plainly as if it were yesterday. And still playing Mr. Television Star 1968, I went over <clears throat> after the meeting and shook his hand and thanked him for his great speech. And he looked at me, and he broke the ego bubble that needed breaking. He said, after the caper you pulled on television last night, but goddamn time you got here. <laughs> now, I knew that the CBC was spying on me because they sent the first guy I saw when I walked in there. He was a chemical engineer at the paper plant there, and I'd interviewed him on television three weeks before, so I knew he was a spy. Nothing wrong with my paranoia, was there? Anyway, I remembered that meeting, and I started going to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'd like to share with you now some of the things that it has been my joy to experience getting well, recovering in this marvelous fellowship. I'd like to tell you what's happened to me and to my family since I came to you. I'd like to tell you some of the things I've learned and what they mean to me and the value that I find in this marvelous thing called Alcoholics Anonymous. Six weeks sober, I stood in the hospital room and I watched my mother die of cancer. And that day, God removed from me the compulsion to drink. Because that day, I prayed to God. A God that I did not know or understand, I just simply prayed, sitting in my automobile with the taste of Amber Bacardi cascading down my throat. I was so new, I didn't know the serenity prayer, but Cliff had equipped me well. He gave me that little white card. And I couldn't stand the pain and the compulsion after I watched Mom die and I stopped the car on my way to tell my sisters that she was dead and I prayed that prayer. It was August the 19th, 1968. I read the prayer off the card and I said the Amen. And the compulsion was gone. And I'm here to tell you tonight that it has not returned since. You can call that a psychic phenomenon. You can call that anything you want. I just simply call it a miracle. A gift from God that I did not deserve and to this day do not deserve, but I am so grateful for. 
We buried my mother, and I went back to Corner Brook and back to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I listened. And Cliff gave me a book, a book like this book that I carry around. This is a, about the 17th book I've had. The only reason I keep this one is because Betty gave it to me in 1973, on my birthday, my natural birthday. Cliff gave me this book, and he said, read it. See, we have tough sponsors in Canada. They don't play games with you. They just tell you what it is like and what you are to do, and you had better do it. If not, they're going to be breathing down your neck all the time. Hmm. So I took the book home, and three days later, I took it back. I read fast. And Cliff just about landed that thing up the side of my head. He said, take it home, dummy, and study it. And six months later, I brought it back to him. And he looked at me with that strange look again. And he said, now take it home and read it. And Cliff and I had many meetings. Uh, we met in the Chinese restaurant. We drank a lot of tea. And I got sick and tired of hearing some truths. And it took me, and I thought I was a fairly bright fellow until I met this Cliff. But it took me, and I hate to tell you I was this retarded, six months to figure out what he was doing. He was taking me into a Chinese restaurant that had the best clientele in the city, feeding me tea and giving me AA. I wonder why he did that. One night, about 1 o'clock in the morning, after we closed the place again, I was driving home. You know, and I guess I must have been getting well, because a little light went on, and I thought, I know why he did that. He knows how badly I feel about being drunk on television. He knows he can give me hell, and I'll take it, because I don't want to make a public scene anymore. And that was how he did it. And I learned. I graduated uh, after about six months, you know. I learned it all. And I bought my first new AA sports jacket for television. And I started showing up late at the meeting. Five minutes late. As soon as the Lord's Prayer was over, I was out the door. I did that for about three meetings. And I walked in with my new AA sports coat on. Sunday night. And Clifford was at the door. I was late, meeting finished, and I was on my way out the door, and he grabbed the lapel of that brand-new AA sports coat. I somewhat affronted, and he said this to me, we are going to talk. Now, he didn't suggest that it was in my best interest that we talk. He didn't diplomatically say it was advantageous to my sobriety that we talk. He said, we are going to talk. Correction, I'm going to talk, you're going to listen. And that's exactly what happened. That's what we need in AA. That kind of sponsorship, in my opinion. We need people who are not afraid to confront us with ourselves. And as I look back on that relationship, I discovered something about Cliff. He never once answered a question for me. Never once. He made me find my own answers. And I believe that we all have our own answers. I'm reminded of the story of the old Jewish gentleman and the Gentile. And they had been friends for 40 years. And they both retired from business. And on the day that they retired, they met for coffee. And the Gentile said to the Jewish gentleman, Jaime, there's one thing I want you to tell me. And Jaime said, what's that? He said, how come? After 40 years in business, every time I ask you a question, you answer with another. And Jaime looked at him and said, Well, why shouldn't I? And that's what we need. People who love us enough to make us find our own answers. Because I've come to believe that the answers to our insanity are all internal. It has occurred to me, and I got in a lot of trouble in AA about this one. See, I talk a lot about God now. 
to talk about God because I came to believe in God, a loving, understanding, compassionate Father. And I found out about God in this book. And I had some people in AA come to me and say, for God's sake, don't talk about God so much, which I thought was rather humorous. You know, I, I started reading this book and I started finding some things. And if I read this book to you, it's because I don't want to be taken out of context and I don't want you to misunderstand some very important prose. It says, this is the how and why of it on page 62. First of all, we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. Next, we decided that hereafter in this drama of life, God was going to be our director. He is the principal. We are the agents. He is the father. And we are his children. Most good ideas are simple. And this concept was the keystone of the new and triumphant arch through which we pass. Freedom. And this is not Les Stidley. This is the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's what I learned, that there was a God. And that I didn't have to apologize to anyone for him because I went a little further. And on page 68, I found this. We need never apologize to anyone for depending upon our Creator. We can laugh at those who think that spirituality is the way of weakness. Paradoxically, it is the way of strength. The verdict of the ages is that faith means courage. All men of faith have courage. They trust their God. We never apologize for God. Instead, we let him demonstrate through us what he can do. We ask him to remove our fear and direct our attention to what he would have us do. At once, we commence to outgrow fear. I knew that you had something, you see. I knew that you had something that I didn't have, and what you had was faith and a belief in God. And I didn't have it, and you gave it to me. And I'm sure some of you wonder how it is that I'm here. And why, it's simple, in 1970, Betty and I were taken by Cliff and his wife to Florida, to the International Conference of Alcoholics Anonymous. We were taken because we couldn't afford to go. And it was there on a Thursday morning in July that I met my second sponsor. His name is Virgil. And I am deeply indebted to him, indebted to him because it was Virgil who took me apart two years later here in Atlanta and put me back together again. And it was his lovely wife who broke down the seven foot cement bar or wall that surrounded me. Even after some time in AA, I still didn't believe you, you see. I couldn't believe that you could love the way you do. I couldn't believe that you had this thing called unconditional love, that it didn't matter what I did or where I'd been or what I had said, that you would love me regardless. And I never want to forget being in Margaret and Virgil's kitchen on a very bright morning. Betty and I had come out from the guest room. And I don't know if she orchestrated it, but I know it happened. And she set Virgil on one end and me next to him and Betty next to me, or Betty on the far side, and she left the chair vacant and she poured the coffee. And then she sat down and she reached over and she took our hands and she held them up. And with that beautiful Georgia accent that you all have, she said, if anybody told you they loved you today. And I looked at her like she had seven heads and she was growing another. I wasn't used to that at 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning. Nor was Betty. And I kind of gave her that look. She very quietly squeezed our hands and said, I just want to tell you I love you. And the tears came. The tears came because... There's a relationship between touching and feeling. And Margaret knew that. And the barrier came down. And I began to feel 
from you what I'd looked for for 12 years in a bottle. I began to feel loved. I began to feel wanted. I began to feel human. And we continued to come down here, and as Lou told you, we got involved with Donna and a bunch of them and young people. We went to Cleveland and San Francisco and Atlanta and Chattanooga. We went everywhere our dollars would let us just to be with you because we knew. We knew that there was some magic here. There was some power here. There was something here that allowed us to grow as human beings. And I sat back some days in amazement and looked at our family. I looked at a boy who was now growing up, who was six years old when Cliff found me. Because I don't believe I found Cliff. I believe God sent him to me. I looked at this boy who was neurotic at six because of his father's drinking. And I looked at his brother, who was three, and I realized something very profound, that we were growing up together. We were all children, and we were growing up together. And the reason we were in Corner Brook two weeks ago was to attend the wedding of our 22-year-old son. I want to tell you that, I want to share that with you, because... It symbolizes more than anything else I could tell you what this program means to me and where we can grow if we allow ourselves to grow. He called us and uh, he said he wanted us to walk him down the aisle before he met his bride. He's six foot two, he weighs 220 pounds, and if you want to take time after the meeting, better to show you a picture. And we walked him down the aisle, and he kissed his mommy, and he kissed his daddy. And we wished him well. And he called me two days before the wedding, and he said, Dad, you and Moya's father are going to participate in our wedding ceremony. And I will never be able to express what it meant to me to stand in that church and read the lesson at our son's wedding. That little boy that was so neurotic allowed me to share his most important day. Before we left yesterday to come down here, his brother, who I think might make it here someday, I hope he does, gave me a big hug and he said, you tell him all we love him. And he does. He does. He's just a little crazy like his father. And I love him. But I don't love what's happening to him. Moments. You see, our lives, I believe, again, are just little tidbits of happiness. And they're amplified by the joy of sobriety. I believe that in all of us, there is a spark. Just a spark. Somewhat like a honing device that they use on aircraft, you know. And if an aircraft crashes, this honing device is activated. And I believe we all have it inside, and one day that device is activated, and we start tuning in to God, where all the power is. And that's the way it's been with us. How do I know that? Because I've experienced that. It's not something I read in a book. It's something I've experienced. Two years ago in October, I attended another funeral. By the way, I've lost my brother through alcoholism and a brother-in-law. Two years ago, October coming, on a Sunday night, I got a telephone call from Halifax. The man whose son I felt unworthy to be had just died. He died in a most miraculous and beautiful way. My dad and I were able to put back a relationship because of you. And after I was sober seven years, he told me that when he died, he wanted me to speak at his funeral as he had heard me speak in Alcoholics Anonymous. 
And I said, Dad, you have no idea what you're asking. And he said, I'm not suggesting you're going to do this alone. But you will do it. He had gone to his church on Sunday night, and the pastor had asked him to pray. And he had prayed. He sat down, and he fell forward, and he was dead in 30 seconds. So we went home to do what we had to do. And I stood in his church on Wednesday afternoon, the 6th of October, 1982. And I did something that I never thought I would ever do. I talked to my dad's funeral. And I had a most miraculous, wonderful experience that I never want to forget. I stood in that church and I read from the Bible what he wanted me to read. And it, it seemed to me that I was surrounded by all of you in spirit. That you were all there and just off to my left seemed a power so intense and so beautiful that I could almost touch it. And I was absolutely serene and calm. God will constantly do for us what we cannot do for ourselves, says this book. All of the promises that you find on page 83 and 84 of this book have come through in my life. And what's God like? Well, a few years ago, somebody gave me this, and it describes what God is like for me. God is like bare aspirin. He works wonders. God is like Ford. He's got a better idea. God is like dial. He gives you round-the-clock protection. God is like Coke. He's the real thing. God is like scope. He makes you feel fresh. And God is like Hallmark cards. He cared enough to send the very best. That's what my God is like. Because, you see, in the literal sense, I have not seen God. And yet I have. And I see him now. And there is only one thing missing in this meeting. And that is a giant mirror here at the front. So you could see what I can see. I look down in Craig's eyes. I see God. And the problem with that, I see the joy of his heart in his eyes. I could feel it. I don't need a drink to feel it. We're going to close this meeting in a few minutes, and all of us will feel it again because something that you do here in the southeast that is miraculous will happen all over again. We will join hands, and the collective power of ourselves tuned in to that higher power will be activated again, and you will feel that marvelous surge of joy and gratitude surge through your body as I will feel it surge through mine. That's what's in here. That's what's here. An awareness of God in us. And isn't that why Les drank? Of course that's why he drank. He was afraid to believe that he could feel. How is this possible? How has it come to be? I've asked myself that question a thousand times, I suppose. And then one day I went back to this book, and there I found it. And it is incredible when you sit and you study the last seven sentences in this book. Because the formula for happy living the formula for all of the problems that I will encounter is contained in the last seven sentences of this book before the personal stories. And it is explicit and direct. And a seven-year-old can understand it. Even a dumb Canadian can understand it. It says, abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. 
clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit. And you shall surely meet some of us as you trudge the road to happy destiny. Nothing complex. Nothing complicated about that. Just a direct formula that allows me to live with me in harmony with you and with my God. And these are not my words. This book. This book. That I heartily recommend for your reading and study. Based on my own experience. I've tried to find analogies that would cover and say to all of you how I really feel. And I would like to leave you with this. If you were to ask me to give you in two minutes my experience, strength, and hope, it would go like this. It seems to me that I was in a whirlpool in a dinghy, a little rubber boat, without a paddle. And that whirlpool was filled with fog, and I was alone and afraid. And I was going nowhere except around in circles. And mystically, it seemed to me that a boat, a much larger boat, appeared out of this fog. And in that boat was a man five foot two. And he was rowing. And the boat was called Light. And his name was Cliff. And he said, are you lost and are you lonely and are you afraid? And I said, yes. He said, do you want to live in your dinghy and die? And I said, no. He said, then come with me to my boat. And he reached out and he helped me out of my lonely rubber dinghy. And he put me in his boat. And he said to me, my son, if you want to escape, your loneliness and your fear, then pick up the oars and row. And I did. And we started to come out of the fog and I beheld something incredible that Cliff was not alone. That sitting next to him was a man named Virgil. And Virgil said, Boy, If you want to experience all there is to experience in this program, stop talking and listen. Hear the wisdom of your elders. Enjoy the life that is sober. And row. And row. And pull harder. And as we came out of the fog, I noticed that it was filled with this boat called life. Thousands of people. They all had an affliction like mine called alcoholism. And together we were rowing. And one day, the fog lifted. And the sun broke through. And it was warm and pleasant and lovely. We had our problems. Our boat length. It would leak and we fixed it. We got off course a few times and somehow... Some unseen captain put us back on course. And our lives have been filled with beautiful days of happiness and joy and some pain. And we have come to know light. And we have come to know love. And we have come to know our Creator. And how is it all possible? Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit. And you shall surely meet some of us as you trudge that road to happy destiny. I love you. God bless you.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.